a uh, couple things before we. No, I'll talk about this later. Do this first. Okay, so we left off in the wife of Beth's tale on page 348, um, where the wife says, the old, the old lonely lady, who I'm going to refer to as the wife, says to <coughs> the knight, who's never named, by the way, um, you behave or act like a man who's lost his wit. This is line 1095. What is my guilt? For God's love, tell it, and it'll be amended, if I am able to, if I may. And he says, amended, amended, improved, fixed, repaired, alas, nay, nay, it will not be amended forevermore. What's the it? For thou art, excuse me, thou art so loathly, ugly, and old, and thereto come of so low a kind. Kind. We've talked about that word before. A nature. You are of so low a nativity, a birth, okay, your family name, etc., that little wonder is though I wallow in wine, ride. So would God my heart break. Destroy. Would. I wish God would kill me right now. Why? Because although I'm married to you, I don't have to sleep with you. Right? Is she saying, you know, this is our wedding night. This is how men normally behave on the on the wedding night. And he's saying, I'd rather die than have sex with you. She says, is that it? Is that all? Is this the cause of your unrest? Certainly. And she says, sire. What's sire mean? Lord. Now, Lord. And I don't think she means that, Lord, the one I follow and obey and bow down to. I just think that is a term of respect. Okay? I could fix this. If I wanted to, within three days. So well ye might bear yourself unto me. If, she said, you would kind of behave better towards me. I, I can fix all of this. He's thinking, wait, what? How can you fix your being born of low degree? of lowly name. <coughs> How could you fix being older than dirt? <laughs> How can you fix that? That ugly visage. But, she says, 1109, for you speak, because you speak of such gentle essa, as is descended out of old richessa, that therefore should you be a gentleman, such arrogance is not worth a hint. She says, you talk about this idea, gentilessa, that comes from old riches. Now, old riches might mean literally old wealth. What's the difference between Bill Gates and, I don't know if you know the answer to this other part, Anderson Cooper. Anybody know who Anderson Cooper's mother was? Gloria Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt name goes back. Quite. Gates? Bill Gates' money is all what? It's all new money. Or Zuckerberg would be even better. Mark Zuckerberg and somebody from the Carnegie family. The Carnegie family wealth goes back minimum 150 years. Okay. Zuckerberg's wealth, 
Yeah, his parents were loaded. He was a Harvard snot, you know. But his wealth today, or Elon Musk would be even better, you know. Guy's worth a quarter of a trillion dollars, right? It's all new. She's saying, you think your gentleness that comes from your old family lineages, your old family name, your old blood. She says, in that therefore, because of your old family name, you are a gentleman. You have this title about you. And she says, that's a bunch of BS. That's not worth a hint. Look, who that is most virtuous always, right? Always virtuous. What does that mean? Privately and apart, and most intended also, and most intends also, to do the gentle deeds that he can. Take him for the greatest gentleman. The real gentleman, the real person of nobility and virtue is the one who does what? The one who does gentle deeds privately, outside the public eye. You know, you hear about celebrities donating XYZ amounts to some charity, to some group. Why? Because it looks good. It builds up the public image. She's saying, look at the person who doesn't get the publicity and who still gives. The person who privately gives. Well, we can't look at the person who privately gives. Why? Because we don't know. So she says, take that individual for the greatest gentleman. Christ desires, wishes, wills that we claim from him our gentleness. Okay? Now this is the wife putting, the wife of Bath, putting these words in the old loathly lady's mouth. She's saying, the old loathly lady is saying, Christ desires once that we derive our nobility, our virtuous nature, our virtuous name from him. That, in other words, we descend from him. Not literally, not lineally, biologically, but morally, spiritually. Not of our elders, our ancestors. For our, for their old riches, for their, for what they've earned and gained in their lives. Now that can be earned and gained in their lives, like monetarily, or it can be earned and gained in their lives by their actions. Right? It's like somebody today who's, you know, I'll use my family. My brother's the quote unquote family genealogist. He's traced our family line back to way before the Mayflower. But they were on the Mayflower. Okay, uh, he's got on one side of my family. He's got us traced back to the time of Alfred the Great, through birth certificates and all that kind of documentation. I mean, the actual the whole nine yards. All right, she's saying that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. If I could trace my family line back through all these kings and queens of of England, no. Just because they were kings and queens and just because they may or may not have done wonderful things doesn't mean that those wonderful things attach to my name. For though they give us all their heritage, that is, the name, the baggage, think, you know, <coughs> um, when Prince Harry was in the military. Anybody know what the name he went by was when he was called? It was one word. Windsor. Why? Because he's an heir of the house of Windsor. And his older brother 
in his unit was called Windsor, because he's the next in line after Prince Charles. Okay? She's saying, that heritage, it doesn't matter. For though they give us all their heritage, line 1120, for which we claim to be of high lineage, we can look back and say, oh, look, we can trace our family name back all these years. Yet may they not bequeath for nothing to none of us their virtuous living. In the Lord of the Rings, the character Aragorn says in the chapter of the Council of Elrond, someone mentioned, oh, this is Aragorn, son of Aragorn, and he's descended through long lineage from Elendil and Isildur. And Aragorn says, I am descended from them. I'm not them. Why? A lot of time has gone on. What he's suggesting there is, I'm just a, a poor copy. It'd be like somebody today who's a descendant of George Washington, kind of demanding respect for being a descendant of George Washington. It's like, yeah, but you're a bum on the street. Because <laughs> there might be bums on the street who are descendants of George Washington. They may not bequeath none of their virtuous living that made them be called gentlemen. That is, they earned the title gentlemen. Why? Or how? Look at how they behaved. Because of their actions. And bad us, they requested, or you could even say commanded us, to follow them in such behavior. They commanded us to behave like they did. Well knew the wise poet of Florence, Dante. Okay? And so what does she do? She, the lowly old lady in the wife of Bath's tale, she appeals to an authority. Now, the wife began her prologue with the words, Experience, though no authority were in this world, were right enough to me. She's saying, my experience of life, even if there weren't any acknowledged authorities. And here, the lowly old lady is, apply, is, is appealing to, to an authority, Dante. Chaucer refers to Dante a lot in his work. Okay? And she goes up and talks about, you know, Dante such. Um, 1129. God of his goodness wishes, desires, wants that of him, from God, we claim our gentilessa. For of our elders may we nothing claim but temporal things. What kind of temporal things can we claim from our ancestors? Maybe not even our distant ancestors, our immediate ancestors. What can you claim, so to speak, from your parents when they die? Assuming they left a will. The things in the will, right? House, cars, clothes, bank accounts, etc. Those are the things. Every one of those is what? Go back to the wanderer, Lana. They're fleeing, they're lone, they die, they dissolve, they rust. The temporal things that man may hurt and maim, right? You get a car, you can break it. You get a house, you can burn it down. Temporal things don't last. Also, every creature knows this as well as I. If gentilessa, if this kind of idea of nobility, of a virtuous nature, she says, were planted naturally unto a certain lineage all down the line, privy nor part, then would they never find to do of gentilessa the fair office. They might do no villainy or vice. So, if this... <coughs> notion of virtuous behavior 
was genetic. Then what wouldn't happen from ancestor A to descendant Z? Descendant Z would just be as morally, virtuously pure, etc., as ancestor A. And she's kind of saying, no. And she's going to kind of give examples. Take fire and carry it into the darkest house betwixt this and the mounts of Caucasus, the Caucasus Mountains over in far eastern Europe, uh, southwest north of Turkey and such. And let men shut the doors and go there, and go away from there. Yet will the fire as fairly blaze and burn as 20,000 men might it behold. His office natural, that is, the thing that fire is from its origin, okay, it will hold upon peril of my life until it dies. Here may ye well see how that gentry is not annexed to possession. That is, um, what something is, is not tied to what it owns. Because folk do not do their operation or do not behave always as does the fire blow in his kind. Fire will always be fire. Fire will always be hot. People do what? They're not always the same, are they? Look, here's a perfect example. Look at a politician. Let's say, you know, I've got over here the group for the protection of, you know, moral perfection in children. And over here I've got the group for the abuse of children. No, it's for the abuse of children. Not defending against abuse. Okay? I'm a politician. I'm going to say one thing to this group, but I'm going to say something different to this group. What does a politician do? What are you told in every kind of beginning writing class? What must you know? Or speech making class? You got to know your audience. That's why you hear politicians, you know, who are not from the South. Hillary Clinton did this. Left and right lampooned her for it. Hillary Clinton came down to the South and she started dropping y'alls all the time. Dropping her G's. Dro you know, using this Southern drawl. It was totally effective. It wasn't sincere and real. That's kind of what she's getting at. Okay? Fire is what? Whether the fire is here or here or here, it's always going to be fire. It doesn't change its nature. Okay? For God, it knows, men may well often find a Lord's son do shame and go. The Lord might be good. And he that will have Esteem for his gentry, that is, for his ancestry, for his genealogy, right? Why? Because he was born of a gentle house. Gentle here means high, noble, well-respected, morally, you know, kind of pure, so to speak. And had his elders noble and virtuous. And nail himself in do, and does not himself do gentle deeds, gentle, noble, virtuous, courteous, mannerly okay, deeds. That is, the person who thinks, because I'm descended from high, noble minded, virtuous minded people, etc., but doesn't himself do these things, what? He does not follow his gentle ancestor that is dead. He follows in name, he's got the name, but he doesn't follow in behavior. Nor is not gentle, is not virtuous, is not noble. Notice, 
1157. Be he duke or earl. Whether that person is a duke or an earl. Well, what do we think? What well, should go along with the duke or earl? They should be high-minded. They should be virtuous. They should be moral, etc., etc. Well, in this time period, it was thought that. 21st century, you don't think that anymore. For villain sinful deeds make a churl. What's a churl? That is, in the, the stratification of society in Chaucer's day, that is the lowest level of society. A churl is someone literally, physically kind of tied to the limb. Can't rise above that level. So he say. The duke, or she's saying, the duke or the earl, because of his deeds, is really no better than a churl. For gentleness is nothing but renown of thine ancestors or their high bounty. That is, to the person who believes this way, they think gentleness and nobility is what? All in the blood. Where do we still see this idea today? Does America have or let me rephrase it. What is meant by upper class in the United States? You know, you hear all the time the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, or the poor. We don't even hear lower class anymore. We hear Upper class, middle class, the poor. What's meant by upper class? Rich people. Rich people. The 1%. Okay? Democrats were talking about a billionaire's tax. It's been thrown out the door. Okay? That. Why? Because of the money? Yes. In Chaucer's day, it wasn't about money. And in Britain today, it's still not about money. It's the name. There is still a very staunch stratification of class in, in, in England today based on name. How do you know? Look at the English governmental system. How is it different than the United States? The United States has what? We've got the executive, which is the president, We've got the legislative, which is what? House and Senate. And then we've got the judicial, judicial, which are the courts, you know, Supreme Court at the top. What about the British system? Well, you got the executive, prime minister. You've got the judicial, you've got the courts, Her Majesty's courts. You've got the legislative. What is it? Parliament, which is made up of House of Lords and Commons. Lords. How do you get elected to the House of Lords? Unless you have peerage. That is, unless your name is in Burke's list of peerage, essentially, you can't be a member of the House of Lords. You have to be knighted to be in the House of Lords. Okay? You, you've got to have, you've got to be from that level of society. Some poor, you know, woman selling flowers on the street cannot be appointed or elected to the House of Lords. Okay? So, she says, she goes on, of thine ancestors for their high bounty, which is a strange thing to thy person, that is, the name that they earn because of their deeds is separate to your person. Thy gentilessa, okay, now who, bear in mind, who's she speaking to? This particular knight, who is a knight of Arthur's round table, your gentilessa comes from God alone. Then comes our very gentle Essa of grace. It was nothing 
bequeathed to us with our position. What does she mean by grace? She means spiritual grace by God. Has nothing to do with social position. How do you know? Book of James in the New Testament. Where James, the brother of the Lord, says, you know, you go into a church, you go into a meeting place, don't take the place of, of authority and position. Sit in the back. That way, somebody can come up to you and go, no, 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 you should be up here. That way, somebody else can kind of elevate you. Otherwise, you're putting yourself higher. And they might come out and go, um, no, this is reserved. Can you go sit back here? Right? And what does she do? She then mentions authorities again. 1165, 66, Seneca, Boethius, etc. Okay. 1173. Yet may the high God, and so hope I, that is, I hope this is the case, grant me grace to live virtuously. That is, in order to live virtuously, God's got to give you that ability to do so. Then am I gentle when that I begin to live virtuously and to avoid sin. This is gentleness, she is saying, to live virtuously and to avoid sin. And there is, and therefore, you reprove me for what? My poverty. Damn you for being poor. He's, she says, that you say to me. Okay? The high God on whom that we believe in willful poverty chose to live with us. So you condemn me for being poor, and yet the Lord that you say you follow, what? He chose to be poor. Hmm. And certainly every man, maiden, or wife may understand that Jesus, heaven's king, did not choose vicious living. Vicious, the opposite of virtuous. That is, nobody thinks, you know, Jesus chose horrible, wrong, evil living. Glad poverty is an honest thing, certainty. Glad, joyful poverty. Okay. This is the wife of Beth talking, right? We're going to hear, if we were doing all the Canterbury Tales, we would read the Parsons' tale, and we would be told even more about the Parson. Okay? We would read the Plowman's tale, and we'd be told even more about the Plowman. How they freely and willingly give of all that they have to others. So she quotes Seneca again, and says, let's see here. Let's pick up with 1191. Very poverty, it singeth properly. And she quotes Juvenal, and let's see here, we're going to pick up line 12, yeah, 1205. And therefore, sir, since that I not you grieve, I do not grieve you. That, that is, I don't want to bring grief to you. Of my poverty, no more should you reprove me. Now, sir, of old age, you reprove me. So she said, you've condemned me for my lack of gentle essa, my lack of noble birth. You've condemned me because of my poverty. Now, sir, she's going to deal with one of the other things. You've condemned me because of my age. Certainly, Though no authority in no book, you nobles of honor say that men should an old wife do favor and call him father for your gentleness. But authors I shall find, as I guess. Now there you say that I'm old and foul. That is, you can't find any books of authorities that say to condemn the people for being old. And, and I, I can show you. So she says, now you condemn me for being foul and old. 1214. Then dread you not to be a cuckold. 
because I'm ugly and old, then you don't have to feel what? I'm going to be cheating on you, right? Handsome young men aren't going to be beating down the door to get at me. So you should be happy. For filth, 1215, ugliness, and eld, old age, also mot I thief, that is, also might I thrive, be great wardens or guardians of chastity. Also might I thrive means, you know, God save me. Age and ugliness are protectors of chastity. But, but, nevertheless, since I know your delight, since I know what pleases you, I will fulfill your worldly appetite. Now, what has she already said about worldly things? They're transitory. They pass away. They don't last. All of her emphasis on this idea of gentleness is its spiritual connection. But she says, okay, but because I know your delight, that is, I know you are superficial and you only go for looks. What can be seen? She says, I'll give that to you. Choose now. Choose one of these two things. Have me foul and old till I die. And I'll be to you true and humble, true, faithful, I won't sleep with anybody else. And I'll be humble. Yes, sir. What would you like for dinner, sir? Let me take your slippers. That kind of thing. And never displease you in all my life. You will always be happy. Or, so that's door number one. Or, door number two. You'll have me young and fair. Young and beautiful. And take your adventure, your chance. Adventure. See, an adventure is a chance. It's, it's like you're rolling the dice, right? Of the repair that shall be to your house because of me. See, we think of repair as when you fix something. No. Repair means people coming in, okay? And so you're going to take your chance of the path that's going to be worn outside our doorway by all the men who are coming through the turnstile to get to me. Or in some other place, you may well be. That is, they're going to be a path to our door because I'm going to have sex with everyone I can, or I'll go find them. So here's your options. Ugly and old, but fair, but like ugly and old, but true to you, and faithful to you, and you'll be happy. Or, just the hottest swimsuit model, but I'm going to be totally unfaithful to you. Choose. What do you want? And the knight considers and sore sighs. He's kind of like, swimsuit model, but they're cheating, they're ugly. At last, he said in this manner, 1230, my lady, okay, my lady, what's he just done? He's elevated her. See, lady is equivalent to the, to the word Lord. So, you know, when you see a restroom, used to see a restroom, ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> those are medieval terms. Those are terms of respect. They're not sexist. They're meant to elevate the people who go in there, you know? My lady, so he's kind of lowering himself compared to her. He's rising her, raising her up. In my love, not language he used before to describe her, and wife so dear. We can kind of see where he's going. I put me in your wise governance. Okay. 
I'm making you governor over me. Choose yourself, which may be most pleasant and most honor to you and me also. Notice, he doesn't say, choose yourself the thing that most pleases you right? in me. It's not just about pleasing. It's not just about delight. Choose the thing that most pleases you and me and that most honors us. That honor idea is the thing that raises us up. The thing that, I'm going to turn this noun or this adjective into a verb. This thing that gentilessa, gentilesses, I think, us. I do no force the wither of the two. I don't care. You choose. So as you like, that will suffice you. That will please you. And then she says, then have I got of you mastery. I have control. I have superiority. Since I may choose and govern as I wish. Notice, it's a question. It's not a statement. So, you're giving me mastery. Yes, certes, certainly. Why? I hold it best. <coughs> that is, I think that's best. And she says, kiss me. We be no longer wroth. We're no longer angry at each other. We've now what? We've made amends. For by my truth, that is faith, fidelity, loyalty, promise, okay, I will be to you both. What? She's going to be both ugly and beautiful, sexy and chaste? No. She says, that is to say, both fair, beautiful, hot, sexy, the whole nine yards, and good. People won't be beating down the door to get it. Or I won't be beating down the door to get it them. I pray to God that I may die crazy, starve in wood, but that is except or unless I to you be also good and true as ever was wife since that the world was new. Then I'll be as good and true as ever a wife was. Okay, so that little statement kind of undercuts the thing. Why? What did the wife talk about in her prologue? How faithful, good, and true was she to her four husbands? Five husbands. Mm. Not a lot. But she goes on. As ever was wife, since that the world was new, how faithful, good, true was Eve to Adam. She enticed him with the apple. Okay. And by tomorrow, or unless by tomorrow, it's fair to see as any lady, empress or queen, that is betwixt the east and also the west, Doth with my life and doth right as you left. That is, do with my life okay, and death as you wish. She's saying this to him. Cast up the curtain. Look how bad it is. Okay. What do you mean, cast up the curtain? He's hiding in that four-poster bed. She's on the outside. And says, pull the veil. Now see what you get. And when the knight saw verily all this, that she so fair was, and so young thereto, for joy he held her in his arms too, his heart bathed in a bath of bliss. A thousand times in a row he began her to kiss, and she obeyed him in everything that might do him pleasant or liking. And thus they live unto their lives end in perfect joy. In Jesus Christ, Send us, and she ends with a prayer. And Jesus send us 
Husbands, meek, young, and fresh of bed. That is horny and good in bed. Right? And grace to over by them that we wed. That is, and grace to control them. And also I praise Jesus shortened their lives that will not be governed by their wives. Okay. What was the whole point of the tale? It was this idea. And what has she just, because this is the wife speaking. This isn't the old lonely lady now. Okay? This is the wife of Beth now telling this. She's just completely undercut. The whole moral, the whole gist of her tale. Chaucer does this with almost all of the pilgrims. He has not give a great tale, and then he undercuts it. For example, the partner. I'll say this, and then I'll talk about this. The partner gives his tale. The partner does what? He sells indulgences. He sells pardons for sins. What's an indulgence? An indulgence is like, you know, a piece of paper like this. And it has writing on it, and it's essentially signed by the Pope. Okay? And what the indulgence did was it allow you to sin and get time out of purgatory. Right? You didn't have to do the sin first and then buy the indulgence. You could buy an indulgence for a sin you hadn't yet committed. <laughs> and it would buy you out of time out of purgatory. Okay? The partner also sells false relics. He's got a bag of bones that he calls saints' relics. He has a piece of cloth that he calls a Veronica, a true icon, in other words, all right? And he delivers this wonderful, rousing homily about the sin of greed and avarice. And he finishes it with, all right, let's pass the collection plate, folks. Because what motivates him more than anything? His own sin of greed. So, he delivers a speech, and we're told, you know, hardly anybody can kind of turn a nail. And then he reveals his real nature. That's what Chaucer's doing throughout the Canterbury Tale. Right? That's why it's important to read over those characters that I mentioned, especially in the general prologue. Know the descriptions of it, okay? They're going to show up on a quiz, which I'm going to probably put up today. That'll be due Wednesday. We'll have an exam due a week from Sunday, over the Middle English stuff, okay? Um, okay, let me stop with that and go to this. Uh, I said the other day I needed to make some comments about the papers. Papers are due on Monday the 22nd of November. It's three weeks from Monday, okay? I'm changing the requirements a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. I've reduced the required length. It was seven to ten pages. I'm making it five to ten pages. I've had students before who could say what they needed to say in fewer pages, so I'm giving you that opportunity. So, 1,500 to 3,000 words, <coughs> averaging 300 words a page, that comes out to roughly five to ten pages. All right? You need to have a minimum of four secondary sources. All right? What's a secondary source as opposed to a primary source? Primary source is the thing you're writing about. If you're writing about Beowulf, that's your primary source. So you're going you're gonna to be quoting Beowulf in your paper, right? Secondary sources are things written about that. Articles about Beowulf. Articles about the wife of Beth. Secondary sources are not encyclopedias. They're not Gale research things, okay? They are specific articles, books, book chapters about the specific thing you're writing about. All right? I want to make sure that's clear. If you're not clear, send me an email, and I'll clarify it very thoroughly. Um, the other thing I do have in here, don't use websites or internet sites. 
for secondary sources, that doesn't include things like Project Muse, okay, or databases that give you electronic versions of articles. Those aren't websites. Those are just electronic versions of those papers and such. They've all been, most of them, have been published elsewhere. Now, there are electronic journals that don't have actual physical, right? But that's not like, you know, Joe's website .edu. The reason I'm, I don't want you to just use a .edu kind of website is you'll find an awful lot of stuff that are written by students in essentially 3010 courses. Right? You don't want to cite those. Those aren't scholarly sources, right? Um, you know, what else I say in there, this is not a topic of your choosing. What I would like you to do is run your topic by me before you write your paper. Tell me what you want to write about. And 99 times out of 100, I say, you know, go for it. I might ask for a little clarification, you know, what specifically, you know, if you just say, I want to write about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, I'm going to say, what do you want to write about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight? Do you want to write about, you know, a particular character? Do you want to write about a scene? Do you want to write about the theme? That kind of thing. So kind of narrow it, all right? Um, for next week, today's Friday. Monday will, I've got to do kind of a general overview lecture on the Renaissance. That'll probably take most of that period. Um, and then we'll start Shakespeare. There are more sonnets on the syllabus than these. These are the ones I want you to focus on. I don't know that we'll talk about all of these, but these are the ones that will show up on a quiz or exam. So I'll read them out. Numbers 1, 2, 18, 20, 29, 30, 73, 93, and 94, 98, 106, 116, 127, 129, 130, 135, 144. And of those, really, Emphasize. I mean, read really carefully. One, eighteen, thirty, and one sixteen. I actually designed a whole course just on Shakespeare's sonnets. I've never been able to teach it because we're teaching. We're not offering hardly any of our forty-nine hundred courses with that. Uh, ideally, we would do all one hundred and fifty-four. Okay, we'll stop there unless you have questions or comments. And if you do, fire away. The Sir Gowan and the Second Sir Gowan and the Green Knight quiz is up. Put it up last night. It's due Sunday. I'll put the Chaucer one up. We'll say it'll be due Wednesday. And then the medieval exam will be due uh, Sunday of next week. Good one. Yep, you too. Have a good weekend.